Joe Laurier is the next speaker. As the editor-in-chief of Consortium News, he's also a former UN correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, and other newspapers, including the Montreal Gazette, the London Daily Mail, and the Star of Johannesburg. He was an investigative reporter for the Sunday Times in London, financial reporter for the Bloomberg News, and began his professional work as a 19-year-old stringer for the New York Times. I'll tell you what, that's amazing. He's also the author of two books, The Political Odyssey, with uh, Senator Mike Gravel, forwarded by Daniel Ellsberg, and How I Lost by Hillary Clinton, forwarded by Julian Assange. He's editor-in-chief of Consortium News, who are doing the live stream for us tonight. Thank you so much. The Assange campaign has been able to rely on CN for its consistent and regular reporting, strongly countering the bullshit from the mainstream SM. Now, I can't stress this enough. Now, I know there's a lot of agencies out there, Counterpunch and so on, Canary and what have you, but CN, they have given us the most meat. So when we're looking back, we can almost see day by day, whereas these other guys are week by week. But they're all good. No, don't miss, everybody can just do what they can. These two have managed to do a lot. So, let's make him feel welcome. Come on, everybody. A big, big cheer for Joe Laurier. Thank you, Ian. <clears throat> yes, indeed, I'm going to sit down. I tell you, it hasn't really sunk in yet. Um, I, I, it's hard to believe because we, for so long, most of us, I think, thought he would wind up for the rest of his life in an American dungeon and die there. And why did we think that? Because we saw so many irregularities in this case uh, that judges in Britain let go. Uh, for example, the spying, the 24-7 spying directly to the CIA. The fact that the spying included on his com privileged conversations with his lawyers, his doctors examining him. This was all uh, the government that was prosecuting him, the intelligence agency of that government, was spying on the communications he was having with his lawyer. Any other case, that would have been thrown out immediately. And this wasn't. The British courts kept accepting all of these irregularities. And you couldn't help but think this was a political case completely from the very beginning. For example, Judge Vanessa Bareza in the lower court in the extradition case, September 2020, she ruled when she said he should not be extradited for health reasons, but agreed with all the other arguments of the United States. She ruled that the First Amendment guarantees that were required by the European Convention on Human Rights to which British extradition law is, is bound, that that would be settled in the US. Had she asked the US then for an assurance on the First Amendment and not gotten one, as happened just a few months ago, this case could have ended four years ago. But nonetheless, this is a victory, one of those rare victories that you don't think you're going to win. And this reminds me of a, a quote from I.F. Stone, an American independent journalist from starting in the 1940s and 50s, very famous. Uh, he said, the, quote, the only kind of fights worth fighting are those you're going to lose because somebody has to fight them and lose and lose and lose until someday somebody who believes as you do wins. And this is what happened. So this is a lesson about the odds seem completely against us, but you keep speaking what you believe in, keep organizing against it, and you might just win. And this was, of course, a deal that was in the works for at least nine months, the plea agreement. And I want to just ask, why? Why did it happen? Why did it happen now, finally? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Certainly pressure from world leaders like Obrador, the president of Mexico, who spoke directly to Biden, Lula, and other leaders, including uh, kicking and screaming, brought into this Anthony Albanese. He did not really want to say much about this. He kept putting it off. Penny Wong said, well, we can't interfere in the judicial processes of foreign nations, even though Australia had done that at least three times to get back people from Iran and Egypt and Cambodia. So it was total rubbish. Finally, Albanese did press him, Biden that is. I don't think that was the deciding factor at all. There was also, of course, human rights groups, press freedom groups all over the world that eventually joined this fight. And of course, the public pressure from activists like all of you here. This all worked together to bring this. But there was one decisive factor. And, and that was that the United States realized 
around April 4th, this year, just a couple of months, that they were going to lose this appeal in the high court in London. Now, how do we know this? They were going to lose because the Washington Post reported that on April 4th, there was an email. And the email, I'm quoting from the Washington Post from last week, quote, the urgency here has now reached a critical point, quote, a Justice Department trial attorney wrote in an email dated April 4th, seen by the Washington Post, back to the DOJ in Washington. The urgency has reached a critical point, quote, the case will head to appeal and we will lose. That's what the US trial attorney told the Department of Justice on April 4th, because they knew they could not deliver this assurance about First Amendment protection for Assange, without which the British court could not extradite him. As I said, that could have been done four years ago by Beresa, but it wasn't. But this is what sprung him. They could not satisfy that demand of the court. And that was exactly the reason why we learned from this Washington Post article that the British judges, James Lewis, QC, now Casey, and um, Claire Dobbin, they actually said this, and this is also from another email. The lawyers representing the US government concluded they would run into, quote, an ethical obligation to drop the case because of, quote, their duty of candor. They could no longer argue for extradition when a condition required by the court had not been met, the condition being the First Amendment assurance. So the British, they were going to quit. The British lawyers would not go forward and represent the US government in this appeal. The United States was left with nothing to do but salvage something. They did not drop the case. They moved on a plea agreement that had been lying there on the desk of an assistant attorney general in Washington, a deal that had been worked on for nine months. They moved on this at the last minute. And I want to add this. If this, he had been extradited to the United States, to the court in the Eastern District of Virginia, Alexander, Virginia, where I live eight minute drive away from there. I'm very glad I don't have to make that drive to his extradition, to his trial. He would have lost in the US because everything in the indictment is gone from this plea deal. There's no longer a hacking allegation. There's no longer talk about him endangering informants, which is all we heard in that extradition case from Lewis and the others ad nauseum that he put people in danger. It's gone. It's gone. The only thing he had to plead to was something he technically did do wrong. As he said, he honestly pled guilty to unauthorized possession or a conspiracy to commit unauthorized possession and dissemination of defense information which the Espionage Act, as it is now written, does make illegal. It's not only illegal for government officials who sign non-disclosure agreements when they handle classified information. They, it applies to everyone, and this is the problem with the Espionage Act, that part of it. That is clearly unconstitutional against the US uh, First Amendment. When you sign the NDA, you're signing away your First Amendment rights, but a journalist, even an American one, a British one, an Australian one, has not signed a non-disclosure agreement. They have every right to receive that information and publish it. And even though the, all the law is written that way, and it's always been an option for governments, this was only the third time that a US administration tried to indict the publisher of the information of the journalist. The first was FDR in 1942 against the Chicago Tribune because they published a story saying that the US had broken the Japanese code in the Battle of Midway. The second time was Richard Nixon. In 72, he tried to go after the New York Times reporters for publishing the Pentagon Papers. They couldn't exercise prior restraint or censorship. They couldn't stop the New York Times from publishing. But once they did, the US had the option of, of of indicting a journalist. And both times it collapsed. In Chicago, with the Tribune, the grand jury refused to indict, very likely because of the First Amendment. And in Boston, for the Pentagon Papers case, it was discovered that the FBI had been tapping Dan Ellsberg's phone, therefore also the New York Times reporters, because they were speaking to him on the phone. So the case collapsed. This is the only time a journalist was successfully indicted but they couldn't go through with it because, again, the First Amendment stopped them. So what we need here is the 
that part of the Espionage Act to be appealed, to go to the Supreme Court in the United States and to say to judge that this is unconstitutional. Supreme Court in the US is a constitutional court. It could decide this is unconstitutional and order the Congress to change the law. And right now there are uh, amendments put forward by Rashida Tlaib, a congresswoman from Michigan, who said, uh, who put forward amendments to the law that among other things would, would uh, differentiate between journalists or anybody and those government officials who signed a non-disclosure agreement. That's not gonna happen. One bad thing about the plea agreement is Julian agreed to waive his right to appeal. They got that from him in exchange for his freedom and his admission that he'd broken that technical clause. And by the way, in the court, he said, I thought the First Amendment protected me. So he was saying, yes, I broke the law, but the law is wrong. That's what he said. And the law needs to be changed, but he cannot appeal. He also signed away any uh, right to sue the US government, because an option would be a civil lawsuit against the United States to say that he was wrongly brought to this plea agreement because the, the law as it's written, the Espionage Act, is wrong, is unconstitutional. So he can't do any of that. Funny enough, if you read the agreement, the judge in the court in Saipan in the North Mariana Islands, she said uh, uh, the, the deal was that the US government agreed if she didn't accept the plea and dismiss this, he would walk free and he wouldn't have had any uh, uh, conviction as he now has. So she didn't, she accepted the plea deal, he's free. And let's just hope that he's free and safe in Australia. Because yeah, yeah. Penny Wong gave this warning, or was it just a bone thrown to the opposition? As we know, the coalition is, is making a big deal, the Albanese called him when the uh, uh, first person to call Sandra. You know, pure politics, absolute rubbish, when, especially when Dutton, the opposition leader, had agreed with uh, Albanese to, to do a deal to get him out. But Penny Wong said this, we have laws in Australia in relation to national security information. We expect those laws to be observed by all citizens and by all entities. That's our position. Julian has to be careful here. You can, a journalist here can be prosecuted for publishing information. As we saw almost in that case of Dan Oaks and the ABC, they, they could have, but the AFP decided, or well, the Attorney General decided not to, but it could. So I just, just a warning I want to leave you with. The last thing I'm gonna say is, two men that I had great pleasure in knowing who were on the board of Consortium News and who worked so hard for Julian to be free. Unfortunately, we lost both of them last year. And I just wanna remember John Pilger and Dan Ellsberg. Thank you. Yeah.